Hello, I'm Ben McNamee. And I'm Ryan Varney, and this is our project on carbon quantum dots. So quantum dots are small nanoscale particles that possess distinct optical and electronic properties. So currently quantum dots are being used in televisions to emit better and more distinct light and color. And there's also promising um, use of quantum dots in the medical field for mapping and treating cancer more directly. So our purpose is um, currently the methods for producing quantum dots involve very harmful and expensive metals and chemicals. And it's a very um, vigorous lab process. So what we want to do is use carbon, which is very safe and um, cost of, um, and very cheap. And we want to make quantum dots that have those same properties as the metal based processes. And we hope to use those to determine water impurities. So we had various different methods for making quantum dots. The first one was a bottom up method. And this method, we would build up the quantum dots using a carbon source. We use sugar. And we wanted to use household items for our first one. So we use sugar, vinegar, and sodium bicarbonate to make our first trial, which is method A over here. And for our second one, we added sodium hydroxide and we got a more clear solution, um, both of which are bottom up quantum dots. For our second method, we use the top down method. Uh, we call this method C and it's a two step process. First, we would do, we used our basic solution in electrolysis and we had a power bank to regulate the ampage. And then once that was done, we put it through uh, column chromatography to filter the quantum dots. And you can see down here, we ended up getting three different sizes of quantum dots based on the ampage that we would do in the electrolysis portion. So we had two different methods to prove that our quantum dots exist. And we tested the fluorescence and the tensile effect. Quantum dots, due to their optical nature, uh, fluoresce. And so under a black light, you can see that fluorescence to make sure that they are quantum dots. And the Tyndall effect is when you shine a laser through a solution. And if it's a colloidal solution, the beam is visible because it's bouncing off of those nanoparticles. And so here in our next slide, you can see on the top row, the fluorescence of each different methods. And on the bottom row, you can see the Tyndall effect where um, that beam is bouncing off all of the nanoparticles. Another method that we used to determine quantum dots exist was using our UV spectrometer that um, utilizes the Beer-Lambert law to test the absorbance of our quantum dot solutions at different wavelengths. So we took these and we um, made a graph of our results and you can tell on each of our solutions, there's a little shoulder around 330 nanometers proving that quantum dots exist. So along with that, we got our band gap energy from the solution. So we took the, uh, the talc davis mott equation and we got our results and made a talc plot, which um, we did alpha h nu square versus energy. And we took the tangent line of this, um, of this plot and where that tangent line hit the x-axis, we found our band gap in electron volts. And that was around three um, to 3.1 electron volts. So another test that we did to further prove the presence of our quantum dots was the conductivity test. So we know that quantum dots possess semiconducting properties and we wanted to test this by creating a series circuit with a nine volt battery and a multimeter. And you can see here in our data that all of our solutions were able to pass a current, therefore further proving the existence of our quantum dots. And we also sent some of our samples to the University of Kentucky and Dr. Barut was able to put our samples in a uh, scanning transmission electron microscope. And using this machine, we were able to get some of these pictures of our actual quantum dots. So you can see here, uh, and from these pictures, we're able to uh, estimate the size of our quantum dots. So we believe they're between 20 to 25 nanometers, which is uh, very good data uh, for what we were looking for. So another test we did was using FTIR imaging, and this was done at the University of Pikeville with Dr. Hess. So what we did, we placed our sample on the um, on the machine here in the bottom right. And this, this uh, device, it takes light and it puts it through a diamond and the light emitted from our substance shows the compounds within our solution. So what we collected here over on the bottom left is a graph showing, and this large peak is a carbon oxygen bond, which is exactly what we're looking for in carbon quantum dots. Um, so from the beginning, the purpose of our study was to be able to determine whether or not carbon quantum dots can provide a cost effective method in finding metal impurities in water. And so we know that quantum dots with safe drinking water maintains its fluorescence. However, when exposed to water with a contaminant, the fluorescence is quenched. And so 
we, to test this, what we did was we introduced copper two sulfate um, to our solutions to see whether or not the, our fluorescence would be quenched. So in order to prove that quenching exists in our, um, when we exposed it to copper sulfate, we created eight different cells with um, different amounts of copper sulfate and quantum, the same amount of quantum dots and different amounts of copper sulfate solution. So when we did that, we put it in our UV spectrometer and what we got was two different peaks um, at different wavelengths. So our first peak um, and our second peak are presented here in the table and the difference between those peaks in amperage is presented on the right. So here you can see with um, 10 drops of just carbon dots in the top left, the peak is relatively high. And as you go down here to this one with 10 drops of carbon dots and 10 drops of copper sulfate, that peak lowers. And it lowers and lowers with the more um, concentration of copper sulfate until at the end here we have just 10 drops of copper sulfate and you can see that um, there's no peak at all. So what we got from this is that um, with more copper sulfate, the more distance between the peaks, therefore the quenching is occurring. And you can see that on this graph from zero drops to 20 drops, um, that peak, the difference in the peak um, keeps on getting larger and larger and larger. So along with copper sulfate, we use lead nitrate as a contaminant, which is very common in water, especially in Flint, Michigan with that crisis. So what we did was just like the copper sulfate experiment, we made different concentrations of lead nitrate in our cuvettes and we used the same amount of quantum dots and that was our control. So what we did, we found, we used our spectrometer and we found the same wavelengths at the same, um, you know, our, our absorption peaks. And what we did, we found its relative difference. And just like with the copper sulfate, um, you can see that with just lead nitrate, our peak, there's no peak at all, no secondary um, quantum dot peak. But with the 34 milliamp quantum dot solution, we have our shoulder here that just proves quantum dots. So as we added more lead nitrate down here from one to six drops, you see that shoulder go away. So around four drops, that shoulder is almost non-existent. And at six drops, the shoulder is non-existent. So that proves that the quantum dots are um, quenching that metal. So for our conclusion and future goals, throughout this project, we have synthesized carbon quantum dots using two different methods. We've recorded UV visible spectrum. We've determined the physical properties for the quantum dots. We've determined the band gap for the quantum dots. And we've observed quenching of their fluorescence to prove the usefulness of the quantum dots to detect impurities in water. So for our future goals, um, currently we do know the quantum dots exist based on the, um, the experiments that we've conducted, but we wanna take it a step further and see the actual size of the quantum dots themselves and the nanometers. So we can use a SEM or um, a STEM image at the University of Kentucky with a electron microscope. It's a very expensive machine. So we hope to go there in the upcoming weeks to get an actual image of the quantum dots. And we also hope to synthesize our carbon quantum dots using hydrothermal methods as well in the future. So we've been very successful this year in the two science fairs that we've competed in. In the uh, regional science fair, we won the Amazon Innovation Award. We were ICEF uh, international finalists um, and we won first place best affair. In the state science fair, we got third place in the biomedical engineering category. Uh, we won the first place Amazon Innovation Award and we won the American Society Material Science Award. Uh, acknowledgements. We'd like to thank KVEC for giving us a grant to be able to do this project. We'd like to thank the Belfry High School Administration and the Belfry High School Science Department for letting us do this project. We'd like to thank Dr. Victoria Morgan of the University of Illinois and Dr. Arturo Ayan and Dr. Juan Galvez for answering all the questions that we had about nanoparticles. And we'd also like to thank Dr. Haridas Chandran of Belfry High School for giving us the opportunity and the guidance to complete our project.